I love the Chamber of the House of Commons. I'm a chamber devotee or a, a chamber fanatic. I suppose really I regard it as the cockpit of our democracy. It is the heart of Parliament and the heart of democracy for this country and it's a great example to the world. That's why the Chamber is so important. The Chamber is really the heart of our Parliament. It's the one place where members all gather together to ask questions, to debate, to legislate. So this is the House of Commons Chamber. It's said that Churchill himself got involved in a discussion about how big the chamber could be, and it was felt it would make it more intimate and a bit more argumentative if it was smaller so that people are packed in for the big debates. The government typically sits on this side or to the right of the speaker. The front bench is for government ministers and on the left hand side are the opposition and the shadow ministers sit on these benches here too. I don't believe that millions of people are losing confidence in our legal system. I believe that they are concerned about the ability of the European... So if a member wants to reserve a seat for the day, other than the front benches which are reserved for ministers or shadow ministers, members would have to write their name on a prayer card, put it in the prayer card holder, and that would reserve their seat for the day as long as they're here for prayers, which is always the first business of the day. On Prime Minister's questions, uh, it's amazing how many seats are reserved, how many people come in for press. So synonymous with the sitting of the house is the mace that is always present whenever the house is sitting. And the mace is carried in by the sergeant at arms each day and is placed either on the table or below the table if the house is in committee. And maces belong to the royal household. Uh, the current mace was made for Charles II and when the house dissolves at the end of its term, they actually go back to the royal household where they're stored safely. This is called the government dispatch box. So any minister, including the prime minister, that is making a speech to the House or replying to questions from other members would stand at this dispatch box. It can be incredibly intimidating, particularly when the House is very busy, as is the opposition box. If we look back in history, you know, we've had these great, great politicians that have been at that dispatch box, banging away, making statements. So this is the Speaker's chair where the Speaker sits and he is here to keep order in the House, particularly during very loud and busy debates. Order, perhaps we can now make some progress with short questions and short answers. In front of the Speaker's chair are the clerks who advise the Speaker and the members on procedural matters. And the clerk of the House usually sits in this chair and the clerk assistant there. When members are asked to decide on a particular issue that's coming through the House of Commons, um, the Speaker will call a division. The division lobbies run parallel to the chamber on either side. We have the eyes behind the government side and the nose behind the opposition side. So if you're a member of parliament and you want to vote for a particular amendment or bill, you will go through the eye lobby, or if you're against it, you'll go through no. And this is the sergeant at arms chair. We are there to represent the authority of the speaker. Up here we have the press gallery, which is where the media um, sit and Hansard or the official reporters and they record everything so there is a record of, of what is said and done in the House of Commons chamber. And in the other galleries around either side is where the public sit because it's a very important element to, to parliamentary business that it's, it doesn't only sit but is seen to sit. The other very special thing about the House of Commons chamber is you get a sense of the power of it you know and how the decisions that are taken in this place affect everybody's lives. So the stakes are always high. It's always a big occasion. Order, order. In Westminster, we start with prayers, where the Speaker processes through Parliament, arrives, the doors shut. And what's interesting is that that's the only time where it's all MPs. Um, and then after prayers are over, the doors open, the journalists come in, the gallery fills up. It'll then be followed by question time. Ministers have to come to Parliament to, uh, to account for their uh, departmental activities. It might be Home Office questions, it could be foreign office questions or education questions or defence questions. The interrogation of ministers is something that takes place every day, Monday to Thursday. Come on, right, Honourable Friend, tell me how much will be saved 
by freezing police pay on one of the benches opposite. Support those savings. MPs have to put in in advance what they want to ask for part of the session, but then there's a bit at the end called topical questions where people can ask anything they like. We're there to give some answers. We then move on to statements or urgent questions. If something uh, critical had happened, perhaps the Prime Minister needs to report back on a big international conference, uh, then he will give a statement. A member can ask permission from the Speaker urgently to question a minister on a matter that has arisen on which, for whatever reason, the Minister hasn't offered to make a statement to Parliament. Uh, will the Minister make a statement on the Government's plans in respect of the report on employment law? Then we'll get into the main business of the day, which typically would be perhaps the second reading of a bill. So for the first time, Parliament is, is looking at the, the scope of a, a particular bill. Some days, you know, it will be an opposition day, so the opposition will actually choose what's being discussed in the chamber. There's accountability. The opposition can have their debates on their choice, and so can the backbenchers too. So I think it works really well. Members of Parliament can present petitions, and every, any member of Parliament is entitled to do that. And then the, the last thing that happens in Parliament would be an adjournment debate. An adjournment debate is where parliamentarians uh, want to raise particular issues. And it raises its profile because the government then has to send a minister to respond to the backbencher on the adjournment debate. And therefore that minister needs a speech and needs to research what they're saying and, and making sure that they are uh, 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 effectively up to date on whatever the issue happens to be. My role as Speaker, as is true of my work in the Chamber more widely when chairing debates, is not to take sides, not to be on one side or the other, not in other words to be a player, but to serve as the referee of the match. Everybody wants to get the attention of the Speaker, or whoever's in the chair, you know, whether it's the Deputy or whether it's the Speaker themselves, and people, to get noticed, stand up. It's very much for the chair to choose who to call. Members will stand up each time someone sits down. And I'm looking around to see who's standing up, and I then have to decide who to call. How do I decide? Well, I go back and forth from one side to the other, so there's a mix between government and opposition. I'm looking to call members of parliament from different intakes, not just from people who came in 40 years ago, but from people who came in two years ago. I'm looking to get a geographical spread, and to some extent I'm looking to call people expressing a range of different views. The Speaker and the people in the chair are referred to as, as Mr Speaker or Madam Deputy Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker. There's very little use of individual surnames. That's because only the Speaker will call a member by name. Other members will refer to people on their benches as my honourable friend or the honourable member for the constituency. Does my uh, right honourable friend suppose and for members opposite, normally as the honourable lady or gentleman, or again, the, by constituency. Division, clear the lobby. Votes in Parliament are often referred to as divisions. At the end of a debate, typically, the Speaker will say, the question is as on the order paper. As many as are that opinion say, I, and people will yell, I. Of the contrary, no, and very often members will yell no. And at that point, the speaker in the chair says, division, clear the lobbies. Voting's really exciting. Um, and first of all, you have the division bell ringing. Um, and you have that all around the parliamentary estate. Uh, so wherever you are in parliament, you hear the division bell going. And you have eight minutes to when the doors are shut. Um, so the doorkeepers who keep the doors open, um, after the eight minutes have finished, shout, lock the doors, and then if you're not, if you haven't made it, um, you've missed the vote. We divide, and you're either in support of, the, of whatever the issue happens to be, so you go into the, the I lobby, or you're against, so you go into the no lobby, and that's how we divide, and we physically divide, by the way, i.e. we walk through uh, the division lobbies and have our names uh, uh, noted off a, a big list of paper of all the MPs, uh, 
At first, when I came to Parliament, I thought, you know, this, this is a cumbersome and clunky way of doing things. But actually now, after being here for two years, I find it an incredibly useful way for being able to get hold of a minister. Because if I have a particular issue that I would like to raise with that minister that my constituents are concerned about, as a backbencher, it's one of the useful, less formal tools. Parliament sits on a sessional basis, and each session there is a Queen's speech, and that Queen's speech sets out the government's main legislative programme. The first thing that normally happens is there might have been a draft bill published that everybody can have a look at, even before it comes into the chamber to be debated. Once they appear on the order paper, that clerk will read out the title of the bill. It's the formal first reading of a bill. And that sort of starts the whole process off. The next thing that happens is a debate in Parliament. And it's called a second reading debate. And what that really means is, in principle, what do we think this bill's all about? Members from both sides will indicate what they like about it and what they don't like about it. At the end of that process, it will then go to a committee much more positive view of Clause 6. Which Basically, it's just like a project team of MPs from across all the different parties. Uh, they go away and they literally go through the bill line by line. So it's a bit like editing a book. Then it comes back to Parliament and the Chamber looks at this revised bill and then have that final debate. At that stage, the Commons has really had its say. It goes over to the House of Lords. They do pretty much the same process. They then throw it back to the Commons. We debate that all over again. And then generally, we reach a conclusion about what it should end up looking like. The way you introduce legislation as a backbencher is there's, there's a, a presentation bill that you can uh, ask for. There is a 10 minute rule bill that you can again request or enter the ballot. Are now beginning to provide jobs and the economic growth the country so desperately needs. I always look at the chamber and think the chamber is the, the great place of the house. This is to me what belongs to the backbenchers. The vast majority of members of parliament are not ministers, and the responsibility of members of parliament, apart from handling casework for their constituents, is to come to the chamber and to probe, question, scrutinise, challenge. However, will the minister confirm that the Health and Social Care Act creates more quangos than the Public Bodies Act abolished? One of the real main functions of parliament is to scrutinise government. Um, members will do that through questions, um, both written and oral, so it's not just the questions on the floor of the House. Often MPs have their own one-to-one -one meetings with ministers if they've got a particular local interest. Uh, MPs are on select committees and they hold inquiries. And then, of course, there's the backbench business committee. Since this parliament started, the government has given backbenchers 35 days of the parliamentary calendar to schedule for themselves the debates that they want to raise. So that's been a really exciting development and that's kind of really changed the way that that parliament is working. Of course there'll be emergency items that can be brought to the House at times. You know, there could be an emergency statement, you know, big issues that really affect the country, you know, quite rightly. Parliament's got to reflect not something next week, but something that's immediate, and that's the power of the Chamber. The government pursues the work that it is doing, not just to look at the possibility of a British Bill of Rights, but also so that in future we will be in a position to deport people who are dangerous to us. The Chamber, it clearly is the focal point, and it's what people know best. But we also have a secondary chamber called Westminster Hall, that chamber is used for, for debates where, for instance, again, an individual member of parliament might, might be pushing a particular issue. So what it's provided is really a new forum 
in which members of parliament can raise issues and critically get a minister to respond because that's the important thing. The debates that happen in Westminster Hall have actually got exactly the same status, are equally reported as it is any event in, in the chamber. The difference is you cannot have a vote in Westminster Hall. So as long as it's something where you just want to have a general debate about something, there's still the minister still comes into Westminster Hall and gives answers. You've still got the shadow minister as well asking questions um, and making speeches. It is exactly the same, reported in exactly the same way, and the only difference is that you can't have a vote. Can I say at the outset that I also support the overall aims of the government in respect to this issue? Members sit round a hemicycle rather than facing each other as they do in the chamber. And it has the advantage that it's more intimate, I think, than the chamber. The public sit on the same level, which does, for some debates, if you're talking about something that the people listening are very concerned about, makes them feel more connected to the people speaking. This morning, if I may, I want to set out the practical problems and concerns with the government's proposals. You see the chamber packed for Prime Minister's question time, and of course for the big statements, for the uh, budget statement uh, and so on, the chamber is cramped. At other times, my constituents will say to me, well, you know, where are you? Because the chamber is um, you know, either half empty or, 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 or actually you know, pretty empty. Uh, and actually what MPs do outside the chamber is really important. Members of Parliament have a very busy life, I think. Many are members of select committees, so they will be attending meetings probably at least once a week usually. Quite a few will be on something called public bill committees, which are the committees which go through legislation, or they will be on committees looking at secondary legislation or on European documents. If we're not in committee, we will have lots of all party groups that we may be members of, that we are um, you know, subject matters that, that we, we, we are concerned about. But also, you're, you're obviously back in then your office working with your researchers because we field about a thousand emails and letters a week uh, from constituents. The job is so varied and what, one of the things about being an MP that is fantastic is you know, every single day you arrive and you absolutely have no idea what's going to happen that day. It's always completely different. If anyone wants to um, make contact about what's happening in the chamber, I think the first point port of call would obviously be with their constituency member. Constituents have a number of, of ways in which they can first of all contact their Member of Parliament and then ask their Member of Parliament to take up an issue. As many Members of Parliament do, I hold regular surgeries in the constituency um, in terms of by email, by Twitter, by Facebook, in person, over the phone. If it's an issue which a select committee is looking at, then they can write to the committees. They can petition, ask their member to, to lay a petition. E-petitions, um, there's no guarantee that an e-petition would get a debate, but it's certainly one of those things which the Backbench Business Committee would look at very seriously. And of course, they can ask members if something is a problem which they've been unable to get resolved, they can ask them to raise that in the adjournment. I think a lot of people are not conscious that they can come and watch the proceedings. In fact, they don't have to ask their Member of Parliament. People can turn up and queue and get in to watch the proceedings of the House. If people wanted to visit the House and they've got access to a computer, then they can go to the Parliament website. There's a lot of information there and they can find out how to do it if they want to do a tour, if they want to come and watch a debate, if they want to go into a committee meeting. Um, and Parliament is very welcoming and likes having people, so we do hope people will use that facility and come and watch their Parliament. The Chamber is also um, a place of real theatre, um, and I think the public enjoy that. What I would say to the Honourable Gentleman is, is the, the adrenaline Eurozone... adrenaline to be flowing because it's exciting and you're conscious that it's being reported very widely and viewed fairly extensively across the country and indeed beyond the UK. This is a working museum. This is a fantastic building to be in. You know, it's the envy of the world, home of democracy. But it all comes back down to one place, reality. That is the chamber. That's where decisions are made.